Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. Paul's this morning. We're going to begin with our pre-service song together. Why don't we stand if we're able? The Lord is gracious and compassionate, so to anger and rich in love. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, so to anger and rich in love. And the Lord. All that he has made Despite the east is from the west That's how far He has removed our transgressions from us Despite the east is from the west That's how far Well, good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's on this glorious day. It's lovely to have you with us. And if you're here for the first time or if you're new or visiting, we're really thrilled you've joined us. Welcome. It's lovely to have you here. I'm Chris. I'm one of the pastors. And we're looking forward to worshipping God together and getting to know you as well. Yeah, welcome. My name is Tim. And uh, it's good to start in prayer, isn't it? So let's pray before we worship. So Lord, we thank you this morning that we can just gather together to proclaim your name to praise you, to say that you are God and you are good. And so we just pray, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, as we praise you this morning, may your name be proclaimed inside and outside of this church. Lead us in our worship, we pray. Amen. Let's worship. God of the broken, the one who is 
We're going to uh, learn a new song now, just to prepare you all this morning. Um, it's called Pull Me Through. It's by a church um, down the road called KXC. Um, so we're just going to go through it together and maybe, um, yeah, go through it a few times together so we can let it sink in to us this morning. What's in front of me? 
team. If your kid wants to come and join at the front, that'd be brilliant. Give them some support. Ready? Let's do this. Who am I that you are mindful of me? 
pray before the children go to their groups. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you for our young people and our youth. And Lord, we just pray your blessing over them this morning. We thank you for all our volunteers and helpers, and may you bless them too. And Lord, as they learn about you, may they just learn about your love and your grace and your power in Jesus' name. Amen. So our children are going to go to their groups. You don't know where to go. Find someone in a red t-shirt. Younger youth to the left. And if you're in the church, you're going to carry on in worship.
Thank you for this day. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We are called to pray for leaders, whether in politics, industry, finance, education, whoever they are. Paul exhorted Timothy and said, Christians are called to pray for those in high positions. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. We turn to your word in 1 Timothy 2 1 to 4 that says, For all, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to knowledge of his truth. So, Father God, we thank you for this very day. Lord, we bring before you countries around the world. We bring before you Japan, who are mourning the death of the former president, Father God, Shinzo Abe. We pray for the people of Japan, and especially for the family of Abe, the Abe family. Grant them your peace that passes all understanding. Father, for the war in, U in Ukraine, the impact is globally felt. We pray for families on both sides of the fence who have lost sons and daughters and fathers, millions more displaced around the world. Father, your word says in Proverbs 21, verse 1, it says, The king's heart is a stream of water, and in the hand of the Lord, he turns it wherever he will. So, Lord, we pray into respective governments of both Ukraine and Russia 
because only you can reach those hearts and turn them, Father God, for your ultimate will. We understand the impact globally of grain and oil and other commodities being felt throughout the world and in other parts, and think about um, the continent of Africa, Lord. Lord, we bring before you Sri Lanka, a state of emergency has been declared. As the country navigates an economic crisis, we pray for your peace that passes all understanding. We pray that a good and stable government can be secured quickly, enabling a financial bailout to take place and to assist to help all in that country in Jesus' name. Father God, we think likewise, we hear about the extreme weather warnings across all of Europe and in other parts of the world. Wildfires that are spreading across mainland Europe, northern Portugal, Spain, southern France. We pray for guidance and strength and protection for all working to bring those fires under control. Father, protect them as well. They're going out and they're coming in. Bless them in Jesus' name. Closer to home, Father God, we bring before you here in the UK our very first red extreme heat warning, potentially impacting to life, young and old. So Lord, we pray for the impact that this may have on the National Health Service. We think about the travel disruptions. We pray for wisdom in decisions that we make individually and collectively so as not to expose each other to unnecessary risk. Give us wisdom, Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we see more recently again in this anti-trafficking, we continue to pray for the protection of all those who are displaced from their homes and the vulnerable. We pray too for freedom from human slavery. Lord, this very week, the revelation by Mo Farah himself, explaining and testifying as to what he had been through, how he came into the country. Lord, so we know this is still active. Help us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Here in the UK, Lord, we look at the, um, the selection process for a new PM continues this week. The cost of living crisis continues. Trained drivers are, are, are again, threatening to strike. The National Health Service, COVID infections are rising. Lord, so much is going on, but in all of this, you are still God. You are the Alpha, you are the Omega, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and nothing phases you. Lord, we bring before you, Lord, just two more things right now, Lord, our, our, our students throughout the UK, those who are graduated, those who have completed exams, those who are planning to go to university in September, October of this year. Lord, please guide them, order their steps in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that all the challenges that they've seen and faced in terms of the mental health crisis, we know the impact that this has. So, Lord, we thank you for being God, not just of yesterday and today, but the God of all gods. So, Lord, thank you. We bring before you the Lambeth Conference that is due to take place. We understand that delegates are arriving in the next, uh, from the 24th to the 27th of July. We understand about the travel chaos and all that's going on. But again, Lord, in all of this, you are God. You are God. Philippians 4 verse 6 says, We should do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to him. So, Father God, we thank you for this. We th thank you for hearing our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Felix, for leading us. Well, welcome. Do take a seat. Welcome if you've arrived since we've begun. Um, if you don't know who I am or if you're new or visiting, I'm Chris. I'm one of the pastors here. It's really great uh, to welcome you and have you with us. And welcome from me too. I'm Lindsay and I'm also one of the pastors here. In a couple of moments' time, there's just an opportunity for anyone who's got a story of God at work. Maybe it's an answered prayer or kind of God's been faithful in some difficult times or whatever it might be for you to come and share that. Um, just if you don't know how that works, is that you can just come forward. I'll hold the microphone and ask you your name and then you can tell a short story of what God's been doing. Uh, and I'll keep that mic so you can concentrate on the story. And so that'll be happening after we've shared some news now. So just to say about service times over the summer, they're going to stay the same, except that there will be children's work only at the 11 o'clock services, yeah. so not at the 9.15. That's throughout uh, the rest of July and August. But next week, we, a lot of the church are going to New Wine, so it's different again. We're only going to be having an 11 o'clock service next week, so no 9.15 and no 6.30. So if you want to come to church next Sunday, next Sunday, if you're not coming to New Wine, then do just come at 11 o'clock. 
Um, and as Lindsay said, that we're going to be having our children's work will be at the 11 o'clock service. We're also, um, we've, the children's uh, groups are pretty much full, which is fantastic. So thank you so much for those of you who've signed up for that. We are also looking to give our youth team, amazing youth team, who have worked, have done so many amazing stuff this year without a youth pastor, uh, give them a break as well. So we're also looking for at least two people each week just to help with the youth. Uh, so that's 11s to 18s. We'll be doing that together. Um, during the summer so we need people from next week so if you are willing just to kind of help us out with that we'll have materials that are available for you to use uh, conversations to have with young people um, then do come and see me or head to the welcome desk there's a sign-up sheet there uh, that you can sign up for um, so do come and do that as well and just one more thing on uh, young people we are really excited that, um, that we're going to be doing a youth weekend away uh, from the 18th to the 20th of November, it's Friday to Sunday, um, at a, a youth centre called Oakwood, which is near Woking. So we've been there before. Uh, previous youth um, weekends away have been there. Um, just to say that over, we launched it, I think, a week ago. I say a we. Um, the, those on the team launched it a week ago uh, or so, and we've already booked nearly half the spaces for young people, which is really exciting. But also, just to say, if you are a parent of a teenager and your teenager isn't yet booked in, can I encourage you to book in this week? Um, it's uh, sometimes with these events you kind of think oh, we're just hoping people will book in at some point and we're hoping that we don't fill up by the end of the week uh, which is a lovely problem to have but we just want to encourage you if you've got teenagers or no teenagers make sure they book in this week so that we, uh, that we can ensure they have a place Brilliant. And then tomorrow evening, the Wholeness Centre is open here at church, uh, open for counselling and therapy, which, for which appointments are bookable. Uh, but also, uh, as part of the Wholeness Centre, we have healing prayer, which happens on the third Monday of the month. That will take place at the back there in the foyer. And there'll be worship, and then there'll be people who will pray for you. So if you've got something that you would like healing for, maybe um, physical healing, or it might be emotional, um, it might be spiritual, anything at all, where you would value one person or two people praying for you in the context of worship for that healing, then just turn up tomorrow at 8 o'clock, or it might be someone that you know, you could tell them about it. Just turn up tomorrow at 8 o'clock, and you'll be sure of a warm welcome. You'll come to the back door here and uh, ring the doorbell. Somebody will let you in and take you through, and then you will receive prayer. Fantastic. So if you've got a story of God at work, a testimony of answered prayer, you can wait till I finish the notice at least, Nick. Then you can uh, come forward and tell it. <laughs> Nick, tell us your name. Nick, tell us your name. It's my favourite. Don't, don't tell him why. It's my, it's my favourite joke. No one else likes it. Uh, what's God been doing, Nick? Can I help this? <laughs> right. So as Chris has alluded, my name is Nick. Um, I had the privilege of being church warden here for 10 years. You get less for murder, don't you? Apparently. Yeah. Um, so I'm actually going to make myself pretty vulnerable. Um, so just bear with me. Um, but in December of 2020, uh, I had my company medical, which is a three-hour medical. Uh, I was expecting to be told that I drank too much alcohol and my cholesterol was a little bit high, but I was um, told that I probably had prostate cancer. So I then had in uh, 2021, I went for an MRI scan, uh, which followed with a biopsy as well. Um, and I caught it really early, but I had prostate cancer. I sort of had to do that journey slightly on my own because it was during COVID and Teresa couldn't be with me, um, which was sort of slightly upsetting. But anyway, I had my operation on the 4th of March last year, which is called a radical prostatectomy, where they remove the prostate. Um, and what goes with that is quite a lot of complications, actually. Um, there are, I'll let you Google <laughs> some of the, the major things that can happen to a man following that operation. But one of them is incontinence, and that's just the most humiliating and embarrassing thing it can be. Um, I had a lot of friends, I said a lot of friends, I had a couple of friends who had also been through it, so I, I had tremendous comfort from them. But fast forward, I suffered terribly from incontinence, 
and it was the most awful thing. Uh, and throughout that time, you know, I prayed constantly for healing. I'd already been cured from the cancer, which was just extraordinary. Um, but this, the other thing took so long, so, so long. But throughout prayer, you know, God was faithful. And I think my message is that you have to be patient sometimes because it's his timetable and not necessarily ours. But at the end of the day, he came through and I am no longer incontinent as of two weeks ago. Amazing. So it's quite amazing. Yeah. So I know I've made myself pretty vulnerable in front of a lot of people and I don't know all of you really well. So please don't go outside and say there's this <laughs> bloke who's just stood up in church and made a complete fool of himself. But anyway, uh, I just wanted to share that with you that be patient because you will get that answer to your prayer. It may not be in your timetable, but it certainly will be in God's. Nick, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. That's really wonderful. I don't even have to ask if anyone else has got a story. Tell us your name. I'm Bogdan. Bogdan, what's God been doing? Uh, that happened a couple of years ago, but I want to share that because it's a miracle for us. Uh, Chris was here. It happened uh, maybe seven, eight years ago when we started looking for, for house. And I bring my family here. Chris was here, and uh, what happened? I started looking for uh, property maybe a couple of uh, weeks ago, a couple of weeks before. And uh, I started to go with the agencies, speak with some friends, but I, co I couldn't find anything. In uh, one week, I already uh, bought uh, uh, tickets for the family. And uh, one week before, uh, I came here because I know that I don't have any chance to find something. And I was here Sunday evening, and uh, Chris and uh, Richard was here, and they prayed for me. And the next, next day, one of my friends called me and told me, uh, do you know I've got one friend who bought the house and moved out from the house? Do you want to go there and to speak with them? And I say, why not? I don't have any chance <laughs> for anything else. And uh, we go there, spoke with him, and he tell, tell us that he can arrange appointment with the landlord. The, two days later, the landlord uh, came and we spoke with him, I explained him that I'm a Christian, I go to church, uh, everything what I can, because in that time I couldn't speak very well English. And uh, he told me that uh, he will call me. And the next day, Thursday, he called me and, tell me and told me that we have to go in, uh, if I can, I can go Sunday to speak with him. He don't promise anything. And uh, Sunday morning, in the time of the church, around 10 o'clock, I go in the house. And he told me, I didn't know for you, I, want to, I can give you the house, but I want to pay a little bit more to deposit and uh, one rent. And I say to him, no problem, I can pay. I don't have any other, other money, but I can pay for that. The interesting that I couldn't believe it, that, because two days later, I have to go to pick up my family. And that was a big miracle for us. Yeah. Amazing, Bogdan, thank you so much, my friend. always room for one more one more if you wanted to be the one and couldn't match Kari's speed then there were we maybe depends how long you are Kari. <laughs> Kari sorry I've introduced you like I did to Nick tell us what God's been doing Kari so um, Felix alluded to it when he prayed that um, Phil George and myself are working on the team that are preparing for the Lambeth conference and have been preparing for it for a very long time because it was meant to be in the summer of 2020 just tell us what the Lambeth Conference is, for those who don't know. The Lambeth Conference is what the Archbishop of Canterbury gathers, the bishops from any church that belongs to the Anglican Communion from around the world, and they will come in for um, 10 days, arriving tomorrow week. And we have got nearly 1,200 delegates against all the odds with all the visa issues and chaos of travel. They will be coming in. Um, and I was just thinking about what Nick was saying about just having patience. There's so much anticipation. Um, there's so much dissonance and 
frictions between different churches and between bishops and, you know, such a range of, of outlooks and they will gather. And that's what the Archbishop has felt is so important that they do come together and just have an opportunity to share, walk, witness together. So we would just really value your prayers for that period and, and just the, the hope that if we're patient, um, who knows what will be sown over the conference and to come um, out of it. Amazing. Thanks, Kari. We need to pray for Kari and, and for all that's happening with those, those things as Felix has prayed for us. Go on then. There may be room for one more if you were really keen to come. There he is. We're sprinting up now. Tell us your name, what God's been doing. I'm Sandy, and just a very quick one. I've just got back from four weeks away. I arrived in Bangladesh and everybody was very happy because I brought the first day of the monsoon. <laughs> uh, I then went to Mumbai two weeks later. Everybody was very happy because I brought the first day of the monsoon. <laughs> <laughs> I've come back here, and you'll have to be patient. <laughs> Thank you. Marvellous. Sandy's is an amazing charity out in Bangladesh, which ministers to loads of people and apparently has the ability to bring rain where it's dry. Wonderful. Stephanie's going to come and give us our reading, and then Lindsay's going to come and speak. Morning, church. Our reading this morning is taken from Hebrews 11, and it's going to be 23 through to 28. So please feel free to turn with me in your Bibles or on your devices. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born, because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger he persevered because he saw him who is invisible. By faith, he kept the Passover and the application of blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. Thank you, Stephanie. So, I'm Lindsay, in case you've joined since the notices, which is maybe unlikely. Um, uh, and it's lovely to be with you this morning and to have a chance to share. My, I just loved those testimonies this morning, stories of people just walking by faith, which is what we are thinking about today from Hebrews 11, um, the reading that Stephanie's just read, and it's verses 23 to 28. If you want to grab a Bible, there are some at the back, on the right, uh, or you, maybe you've got it on your phone. One of the things I really love to do is to swim in the sea. Now, this is relatively new for me, or it's something I've maybe returned to. I used to love it when I was younger, and then I just went through a phase of just sitting on the beach in my raincoat and thinking, I'm definitely not going in there. Um, but, I, I, but more recently, I've kind of made a decision that, you know, it's really good for you to swim in the sea, so I'm going to do it when I get the opportunity. And um, admittedly, getting in can be a bit tricky, can't it? Because I don't wear a wetsuit, by the way. Um, so getting in can be a bit tricky, and you kind of feel the cold water creeping up you and then the worst thing is when a great big wave comes and splashes you when you haven't quite got used to the temperature uh, that can be really awful but once I'm in I love to go a little bit further out and actually to float on those big waves and not, not to be frightened of them anymore, but to float on them um, once I've got used to it and they're not breaking over me. What I don't like, I have to say, is to go out of my depth. I don't like to do that. Um, <clears throat> when I was about 10, I remember I was swimming uh, on the Norfolk coast and I was in the sea and I went too near to the breakwater 
And as I tried to get back to the beach, the drag of the breakwater just kept pulling me backwards. Um, I don't actually even remember how it ended. Uh, I must have somehow found, found the strength to kind of get myself back to the beach, but I found it really frightening. It was really frightening, and I just, you know, for those few moments, I wasn't sure how it was going to go. So I've always stayed within my depth. And um, if I suddenly find that I can't stand, you know, if I've floated out a bit too far, drifted out maybe a bit too far, um, I quickly make my way back to shallower waters where I can touch the ground. Um, and if I'm honest, I just, if I'm honest, I don't actually like that about myself. I often watch people who are much further out. Mark often, my husband says to me, oh, why don't you come right out here? It's really fun. You know, we can swim out right out to that buoy or whatever. And I just think, no. But I really don't like that about myself. And I often see the fun that people are having. And I think I would love to be doing that. And I kind of wish that I was a stronger swimmer and I had the confidence to go into deeper waters. I wonder if you're like me, playing it a bit safe when you swim in the sea, or do you prefer to swim out of your depth? Maybe you don't go in the sea. I don't know. But what about when it comes to your journey of faith? When it comes to living out your faith, do you prefer to stay in the shallow waters? Or do you like to put yourself in situations where you're a little bit out of your depth? having to trust God for things that actually feel a bit uncomfortable. For me, I think the thought of that is, is quite scary. It's quite difficult. But I would say that once I've decided that I'm going to trust God for whatever that situation is, often I find that faith rises within me and I tend to gain a sort of sense of being at ease because of being in the center of God's will. In Hebrews 11, our reading, the writer talks about faith. Faith, he says in verse 1, is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And he lists in these, these verses a number of ordinary people, Bible characters, who were commended for their faith because they trusted in God's promises. They trusted in his promises even though they hadn't yet seen the fulfillment of those promises. They still trusted. And we read here in, in these verses that these were people who by faith set an example to others by following God's call even when things were difficult. They all did extraordinary things and they were commended for their faith. They were commended for being certain of what they did not yet see. So we read that Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham, I think Chris spoke about Abraham last week, and then there was Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Rahab and Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets. They did all kinds of things by faith. And Moses, too, who we're focusing on today. We've already read about Moses all the way back in chapter 3 of Hebrews. Moses was the one who was a faithful servant of God. Someone who fulfilled his duty to God as leader of the Israelites. And then, here in chapter 11, the writer elaborates about Moses. And we read that by faith... Moses' parents hid him for fear that he would be killed. Do you remember the Pharaoh had ordered that all baby boys must be drowned because he feared that um, the Israelites might multiply and might overcome the Egyptians? So he'd, he'd, made, that, um, he'd made that law. But Moses, hid, that Moses' parents hid him in order to protect him. And they put him in a basket on the river, didn't they, where the Pharaoh's daughter found him and took him home to the palace and raised him as her own son. It seems like God was already protecting this baby from the outset, this baby who was apparently seen by his parents to be no ordinary child. Later, by faith, we read that Moses went on to live out what his parents had seen in him. 
So we read verse 24, if you're following, we read that he chose to identify with the people of God, his people, rather than with the people of Pharaoh's palace, who did not believe. So he chose to identify with the people of God. And then we read that he aligned himself with his biological family, people of faith again. And that was kind of at personal cost, in a sense, to himself, because living in the palace, you would think that could be quite nice, couldn't it, with all that wealth and status? But no, he opted for mistreatment, just like his family and his people. Moses valued obedience to God, and he valued it more highly than all the treasures of Egypt. And he, in a sense, he looked forward to his reward rather than enjoying a reward right here and now, at least a material reward. Later, by faith, he left Egypt, didn't he, to pursue God's call. And he led the Israelites away on their journey to the promised land. And so he stepped into God's command to carry out something that he hoped for but could not yet see. Faith, something he hoped for but could not yet see. And so he appears on this list and he's commended for his faith. And I love the verse at the end of Deuteronomy where we read of Moses' death and it says this, Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to do. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. He lived a life of faith. And you know, it's a life of faith that really pleases God. God loves it when people live by faith. He loves it when each one of you who came and gave testimony, the way that you guys are all living by faith. He loves that. In fact, we read in verse 6 of Hebrews 11, it says this, without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith is really important. It's really important to God. So what does it look like then, this faith that's commendable by God? What does it look like? Or maybe we could start with what it doesn't look like. What does it not look like, this life of faith? And I want to say, first of all, that living a life of faith is not about being perfect. Notice it doesn't say in this passage, God commands those who live a perfect life and never get anything wrong. It doesn't say that, does it? And I'm struck that there's so much we know about Moses and his life that actually wasn't glorious. It wasn't glorious. Moses killed someone. He was a murderer, wasn't he? Moses buckled when God first told him to go to the Pharaoh and have him free the Israelites. He didn't want to do it, even though he'd met God. Another time, he took the glory for something that God had done, providing water for the Israelites by banging his stick on a rock and kind of claiming that it was him that had done that, when really it was God who had done a miracle. Because of that, actually, that third one, Moses sadly lost the privilege of leading his people finally into the promised land. It seems quite harsh, doesn't it? I think that seems quite harsh for, for that, for that but, but evidently not. I'm, I'm certain as well that with Moses, there was other stuff as well. He was human. He was a human being. And I'm sure he got loads more things wrong than are written about. But that doesn't seem to be the most important thing. Because the writer of the Hebrews doesn't mention any of those things. Doesn't mention any of it. And he remains on the list of commendations. And I love that. I love that. What seems to matter most is a relationship with God. Coming to him in faith. Believing in him. And earnestly seeking him. I'm always struck 
by the story of Brian Heasley. You might remember Brian. He came and spoke at our church weekend back in 2018. And um, his story, you, hands up if you were there. Were people there? Yeah, he was great, wasn't he? He was a great speaker, a really great speaker. And um, his story is of growing up in Ireland where actually things happened to him that meant that he ended up in prison. So it was really hard, a tough, tough time in his life. But in prison, he met God in the most supernatural way. Amazing. And since that time, he's become the most remarkable leader and evangelist. And he's integral to the 24-7 prayer movement. And maybe you've re- read or you've seen his book. It's, it's called Be Still. It's the most recent book. He's written several. His most recent book is called Be Still, and I think it might be in the bookshop. Um, certainly some of the life groups have recently studied it, and I know that Connect, the women's cluster, are going to be um, looking at that in the autumn term. He's an incredible person. He's accomplished loads for, for God. He's not perfect. No. Perfection is not part of living a life of faith. And then having faith that's commendable by God doesn't mean either that everything will always go well. It won't always go well. God doesn't promise that. You know, lots of us have had really hard stuff to deal with in our life. Or we are having really hard stuff to deal with right now. And that is flipping tough. And I did check, actually, with the 915 congregation that flipping wasn't a swear word. And they assured me that it wasn't, which I was hugely relieved about because I would be horrified if I thought I had sworn in a sermon. That would be terrible. But it's really tough, isn't it? And I know that lots of you have been and are going through really, really hard times. Really hard times. Jesus says this in John chapter 16. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, you will have trouble. But then he goes on and says, take heart. I have overcome the world. We live in the years, guys, after Jesus has come, don't we? Unlike Moses and those listed, we have the benefit of knowing that God sent Jesus. Jesus who restores and renews and rebuilds and who left us with his Holy Spirit to be our comforter and our empowerer and our enabler. Jesus who enables us even when things are tough even when things go wrong. So a life of faith doesn't mean that everything will always go well. And I think for me, it's been when things have been difficult, when things have perhaps gone wrong or just been really tough. But I've actually grown in trust. Those have been the times when I would say I've had to really dig deep, when my prayer life has really been at its best probably, because I've really sought God and I've really needed him in a way that perhaps I haven't thought I needed him when things were going more easily, more smoothly. I can imagine that lots of you would testify similarly, that when life is tough, if you've been a Christian and you've known the Lord, those will probably have been the times when you have really got to know God in a different way. So things won't always go well. And then faith isn't about a blind leap in the dark against all that you know to be true. That would be crazy, wouldn't it? That's what we might call just blind faith. No, it's not just a a blind leap in the dark. No, it's about prayerfully bringing your thoughts and ideas and plans and laying them before God. That's what faith is. It's about asking God for his wisdom and for his confirmation that you're on the right track. It's about prayerfully pushing doors and seeing whether they open or whether they stay closed. It's about asking others to pray for you, asking others to pray with you as you follow what you believe that God might be calling you to, but you're just being tentative, just testing to see 
what he might be saying. And I just wonder, when you've done that, what's been the outcome for you? What's been the outcome when you've just pushed doors, you've just prayed, you've just tentatively sought him? My guess is that it hasn't always led to some glorious, happy ever after scenario. I guess it hasn't, or maybe not immediately. Anyway, maybe you've had to wait, like Nick was saying in his testimony. Maybe there has been a good outcome, but maybe it's taken a while. I remember being involved with someone many years ago, and she was in a relationship that she knew she needed to remove herself from. She wasn't being treated well. She was being what we might today call gaslighted. And so being emotionally abused in a way that you question your thoughts and your feelings and your sanity. That's what was happening for her. But she hadn't actually seen that until she started talking to others about her experiences. And she then realized that she had to remove herself from that relationship. And it was hard for her because having made that decision, she then, she, she then left the relationship and she found herself on her own. She was isolated and lonely. And she had a period of years when she was, yeah, she was by herself. And that was hard. And I, and I think at times she thought, gosh, did I do the right thing? You know, did I get that wrong? Then a few years later, she met and married a guy who she's been with ever since and who has, um, they've been really happy together by God's grace, by God's grace. But it was tough for her. It was tough. Now, that may not be your story. Maybe you sought to follow God's lead in a particular area, maybe a new job or a change in the way you manage your finances, maybe a change in a relationship, and maybe it's remained tough, because sometimes it does. Moses, notice, he didn't actually get to lead the people into the promised land, but he was commended by God for following his faith, for following God's call. And I know that lots of people who found it really hard, um, have, they found it really hard to follow God's lead. I know that lots of people have. And I imagine that you know people like that too. But often what they will speak of is the incredible peace that comes, even when it's been hard, even when it's been tough, the peace that comes from living out their faith and being, having that sense of being at the center of God's will. I think is a really, really special place to be. So what about you and what about me? Imagine for a moment that this list of the people of faith that the, Hebrews written, the, he, the writer of the Hebrews has put together, imagine that that list was being written after we had died, all of us. So many, many, many years to come. Obviously, it would be a much longer list because there are so many thousands of Christians who have come and been and gone since that list of the, Hebrew, in the Hebrews wrote about. But just think to yourself, would you feature on that list along with Moses? I wonder. And if so, what would the bit about you say? What would it say? By faith, Tony, blah, blah, blah. He's laughing. By faith, Ray, blah, blah, blah. By faith, Bonya, blah, blah, blah. By faith, Joe, blah, blah, blah. By faith, by faith, Lindsay, blah, blah, blah. And as I prepared for this talk, I thought about that question. And I thought to myself, I'm not sure if I'd be on that list. Would I? Because if I really trusted God like they did, wouldn't I be doing way more for him than I am right now? I think I probably would. I definitely could. Or imagine that I didn't believe in God. Would I actually be living any differently than I am right now? That's a tricky one, isn't it? Can people actually see a difference in the way that I live 
that shows I trust God. I hope so, just a little bit. Uh, it's not one to linger on too long, but it is an interesting thought, isn't it? But the thing is, the good news is, that despite us, God is at work through us. That's the important thing. That's the good news. Because the truth is that for centuries, God has been at work among his people in spite of their failings. Think of Moses. Think of everyone else on that list. They all got stuff wrong. So could you feature on that list that will be written once we've all passed on? The answer is yes, of course you could. Of course you would. Just because those people feature in the Bible doesn't mean that we can't live a similar life of faith to them. So, as you pray about that job move that you're considering, because you've sensed God prompting you, or as you seek God about the next step in a relationship, or as you talk and pray with perhaps your prayer partner about financial worries, or as you talk with Chris, maybe, about stepping into a new ministry in the church, maybe kids' work or youth ministry, or maybe leading a life group or something else. Or as we, Mark and I, as we seek God for our move from healing, and as we continue to seek him for where he wants us to live, that's all of us living by faith. All of us doing our best to follow his calling. And that really brings him joy. It really brings him joy. Faith is simply seen in ordinary people living a life of authentic Christianity. It's taking confident action in the light of what you believe you've heard God say. It's stepping forward in confidence in response to the unseen, remember verse 1, being certain of what we do not see. So it's stepping forward in confidence with no perceptible reason for doing so, other than that you sense that you've heard God speak. And I guess in many ways we, Mark and I, are right in the middle of a journey like that right now. We believe we've heard God speak. And we're doing our best to respond to what we've heard because we believe it's God who's spoken for St. Paul's, for us, for the place where we're going to be going next. And so that's us. That, that's us doing our best to live out that life of faith, responding to what God has said. So we can all absolutely take our place in God's roll call of the faithful. We're inadequate, yes, like Moses was. But as we, as it says in verse 6, as we believe that he exists and we earnestly seek him, we have as much possibility as any of those people on the list to be on that list of the faithful commended by God. And if we all did that, imagine what we might accomplish. It would be amazing. Ealing would be turned upside down. <laughs> Why don't we pray? Let's stand. Shall we stand? Oh dear, that fan. Okay, let's just be still for a moment before God. Let's just be still and invite him to come and to meet with us by the power of his spirit. Thank you, Lord, for your presence here. Thank you that you're moving already amongst us. You have been ever since we came in here. And we welcome your presence, Lord. We love it when you come and you meet with us and you encourage us. We love what you bring. We love what you bring, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And I would just love to begin by praying for any of you who would really love to have a deeper relationship of faith with God. Maybe it's already good, but you long for more. You long for something deeper. 
a deeper relationship of trust. Maybe it's something that's kind of gone on the back burner recently and you want to return to it. God loves that. He loves it when we come back to him. And so if that's you, I'd love to just pray for you. Maybe you want to just hold out your hands. Some of you have already got your hands held out. Yeah, some of you have hands up. You might want to put your hand up. Just anything that shows that you long for more of God. You long for a deeper relationship with God. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come across this church now and that you would respond to the hunger that's here. There's a a hunger, I can see people just longing for more of you, Lord, longing for that relationship of faith, of, of daring to do what you're calling us to. Daring to step out, daring to go to deeper waters. And I just want to pray, Lord, that for these people that you would bless them with a deeper, greater, stronger faith. Lord, would you put it in? Would you put in courage to do what you're calling them to? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are with us. That the journey of faith is not a blind leap into the dark. It's a response to your invitation to follow, to walk with you, to trust you with every day of our lives. And Lord, even when we get it wrong, that you continue to extend that invitation. There's one verse in the passage that Lindsay spoke on, which says that Moses chose to be ill-treated rather than to live the life with the Egyptians of comfort and ease and wealth and privilege. And as we were, as I was listening, I just again thinking, I wonder if that for some of us is a reminder of God saying again, I've called you. You've got a passion for something that maybe has grown cold. You know, I wonder if it's something like the climate crisis or racial justice or social action of some particular thing and it's something that you've championed and fought for but you know just at the minute it's not at the forefront of your mind but you sense God saying let's go again let's go again I wonder for some of us if it's you know we haven't stopped in our faith we trust God our faith is okay but maybe it's just that we're not praying once again that others would discover the life that is found in Jesus and that maybe we could play a part in that by speaking of something speaking in conversation about him you know stepping across the room as it were to ask and invite someone to join us at church or whatever it might be and again I wonder whether the Lord's just saying to you let's go again let's go again father for however those people may be whoever which ones of us that speaks to Lord by your spirit lead us speak to us comfort us strengthen us that we may have once again, that heart for those that you, you know, our hearts would break with the things that break yours. That our lives would be attuned to others. Come Holy Spirit, help us to continue to be a church that looks out for those who are not yet here. We're going to worship in a moment. David and Ella and the team are going to come and lead us. and uh, Partly... Uh, as we've prayed for a number of people already, um, we wouldn't necessarily say you have to come forward to be prayed for. But if you've come this morning with a specific thing you'd like prayer for, um, maybe it's healing. You've maybe heard Nick's testimony and just think, actually, I would love someone to pray for me for healing. Um, provision, as Bogdan shared earlier about God providing accommodation, maybe we could pray for, for that for you you've got anything specific there's always an invitation and there'll always be people here who'd love to pray for you uh, and we'll do that in the context of worship we'll sing a couple of songs before and we come back and pray God's blessing on us as we finish so as we worship if you'd like prayer do head to the front if you want to respond to anything that Lindsay has said do come forward we'd love to pray um, and then we'll finish with worship now
pouring out the oil of love as my worship to you. In surrender I must leave my every part, nor receive the sacrifice.
sung earlier Lord in the darkest valley you pull us through Father will you do that through your presence which strengthens guides and fills us with your love so I pray the blessing of God Almighty the Father the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us be within us and among us with those we love and pray for this day and always Amen Amen do you grab tea and coffee I'd uh, love to kind of chat and catch up uh, do you come and find us and we look forward to seeing you again really soon